your decisions, your direction. And um, I want to confirm, I'm sure, the teaching that you receive here. But your belief system is so important. In fact, Jesus himself went from synagogue to synagogue, village to village, preaching and teaching. Why? To affect people's belief system. Because they thought of God a particular way and he wanted to bring the truth to them, to set them free. So I'm keen to affect your belief system in a positive way. Is that all right? Well, that was two of you. <laughs> we'll see how we go. Um, Mark 9.23 says, if you can believe, all things are possible. Um, so uh, I want our belief system to be affected this morning. Um, I've been with Compassion now for just over six years. And uh, before that, I was uh, pastoring a church for 25 years. In fact, uh, we pioneered the church in Lights View, that's in the northeast of Adelaide. And um, we started with two people. And then we doubled in number because our wives joined us. <laughs> and then our children's work went berserk because my brother had five children and I had three. So we had more children than adults. So I'm very pleased to say that the work is still going on to this day. And a younger man took over the work and uh, is doing a great job. Um, I... Um, I'm very thankful that uh, God still had something for me to do and uh, I'm here today speaking about children living in abject poverty so I've been given a promotion I think and um, it's just miraculous how God can change your life. I used to be, I don't know if I've told you this before, I used to be an alternative lifestyler. Um, I used to have long flowing hair. <laughs> I like to dwell on that just for a moment. Yeah. And uh, I was building a mud brick house in Tasmania, lived in a tent, lived with a girl in a tent. And uh, then I came back to Adelaide uh, because my family were here for a visit and my brother had become a Christian and he witnessed to me about what had happened to him. And I didn't understand everything he said. In fact, most of it flew straight over my head. But I saw something in him. And I made a decision that I said, I'm going to follow Christ. And uh, here I am some 40 years later, stood in front of you good people, talking about God. That's the miraculous of a changed life. So God's good. Amen. So I want to just speak to you for a few moments about um, compassion. Now we've got a PowerPoint. I hope my little clicker works. Lovely. So we've got Jesus more powerful than poverty. Lovely. Good job. Now let's see if it moves. Oh, it's not moving. You're going to have to do the clicking for me. Alright. So give me a the next slide. I'll just say next slide. Is that all right? Yeah. Lovely. It's kingdom business is the, the ministry of compassion. We're about the kingdom of God. Our mission, next slide. Our mission, the reason we exist, next slide. I'll go through these slides pretty quick. Is uh, the reason we exist and that is to release children from poverty in Jesus' name. That's the whole reason that compassion exists. We are non-denominational. We work with evangelical mainline believing churches in um, the different countries that we work in. Um, our, um, next slide, our vision, that is a strategy to achieve the mission, is simple and clear. Next slide, please. We are a Christ-centered ministry. Jesus is at the center of everything we do. And um, we're not ashamed of the gospel. We believe it's the power of God unto salvation. Uh, we're child-focused. We believe in the potential of children. 
Um, what poverty says to children is that you are of no value. You do not have a future. Poverty steals dreams from children. But we believe what the word of God says, and that is that children are valuable, that they do have potential, that they do have a future. And we're church-based. We only work through local churches. In the, the countries that we work in, we, we work with over 8,000 churches that run our programs. And um, we're very pleased um, to work and promote the local church. So um, it's a, a wonderful opportunity for the church to really have impact on their local community. Next slide, please. God's heart. Next slide. Now, Leviticus. I know that's one of your favorite books. <laughs> but there's some little crackers in there. And one of them is this Leviticus 19, where God speaks to Israel and says, When you harvest the land, leave a corner for the poor. So God's heart's for the poor. If you're familiar with the book of Ruth, when Ruth and Naomi returned to Bethlehem as uh, widowers and living in poverty, uh, Ruth was sent by Naomi to go to the field of Boaz and glean, and that is to take the stalks of grain. And she went to the corner that was for the poor. In fact, she gleaned so well, she ended up marrying Boaz and became the great-grandmother of King David. So at this point, I usually encourage ladies, if you're looking for a man, learn how to glean. <laughs> that is not politically correct. But, um, but God's heart's for the poor. Right through the scriptures, Matthew 25, Jesus says to the disciples, I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was alone and you came and visited me. And he said, when did I do this? When you did it to the least of these. So God's heart's for the poor. Next slide. God's heart's for children. We know that uh, the disciples were shooing away the, when the children were brought to Jesus. But Jesus said, no, let the children come to me. The kingdom of God belongs to such as these. He was being revolutionary because in those days, children should be seen and not heard. Does anybody remember those type of days? Uh, yeah. Um, in fact, he goes on to say, you need to become like children to enter the kingdom of God. So God's heart's for the poor, it's for children. Next slide. God's heart's for the foreigner. Again, in Leviticus. He's got some little crackers in there. Uh, if a stranger or a foreigner dwells amongst you, God goes on to say to Israel, engage with them, treat them as one of your own. And... Um, Israel says, why should we do that? And God says, because at one time you too were foreigners in the land of Egypt. You see, when God looks at people, he doesn't look at the color of their skin or the borders of their land. He just sees people. So God's heart's for the poor, for children, and for the foreigner. You see the blue square on the um, slide there? On all our collateral, we've got blue square that represents the corner for the poor. And so as followers of Christ, we're called to be involved with the poor. Uh, compassion, next slide please. Compassion began in 1952, which is near on 70 years ago now, goodness. And Everett Swanson, who was a Baptist minister started the work, he was ministering to the military during the North and South Korean conflict. Went from 1950 to 1953, over five million people died in that conflict. And uh, as it was the custom of Everett Swanson, he would go to Seoul, the capital of South Korea, walk the streets, pray for the uh, people, pray for the situations that they were living in. And uh, one particular morning he saw a cart coming towards him that he thought was collecting rubbish. Turned out to be dead children who were being collected on the, uh, who died generally of exposure. And so he was moved with compassion to do something and he began the work of compassion with 35 children. 
that he gathered together and started to care for them. I'm pleased to say today we sponsor 2.2 million children so from small seeds can come big trees. Next slide please. Where we work in the blue South America, Africa, Asia and uh, the yellow are the partnership countries. What's interesting to note that on the Korean Peninsula there they are now a partnership country. They were a beneficiary country, but South Korea now, in 1993, became a partnership country. And I'm pleased to say that over 2,000 churches in South Korea sponsor children. So it's a, a wonderful change that's taken place. Um, we work in 25 developing countries and next year we're going into Myanmar and Malawi where we'll be working with the local churches to start to bring children in. Our mandate to the pastors in the churches is to go into your community, find the poorest of the poor and bring them in. Next slide please. When you sponsor a child, this is what it provides. And I want to say to those that sponsor him, because this church has been such a, a good friend and partner of um, compassion. Uh, and I want to thank you for your sponsoring a child. Thank you, thank you. You are making a big difference in the lives of children that are living in abject poverty. Um, there are 385 million children today living in abject poverty. Now, them figures sound enormous, and they are. But the good news is, 40 years ago, it was 800 million. So it's half. So that's good news. But we don't want it to take another 40 ye years to have again. We want them to see the change take place more rapidly. Um, you can't do everything, but everybody can do something. And if we all band together, that's how you get the numbers and the changes in the children's lives. Next slide. Education, we pay for their education, their school materials, their school uniforms, their school fees. Uh, we want to educate the children because what happens is that goes to the bottom of the list because in poverty they want to get food and shelter as a priority and education is always at the bottom. Next slide. Healthcare, vaccinations, dental care, they, uh, they get them on a regular basis. Next slide. Nutritious meals, that goes without saying. Next slide please. Vocational training, this is really important to us. We want to train up the children so that they're released from poverty. So we encourage them to dream and start thinking what they can be, if they can be doctors, nurses, mechanics, chefs. And so we want to then bring them into vocational training and train them so that they become a resource, not only to themselves, but back to their own families. Our attitude is not just to give a hand up, or a hand out, but to give a hand up so that we can change their situation where they are released from poverty in Jesus' name. Next slide. And of course, coming into the local church, they receive Christian teaching. And we make it clear to every family that they're coming into a church, they'll be receiving Christian teaching. This is what I love about compassion. We meet the physical needs, the social needs, the mental needs, but also the spiritual needs. We want to tell them through the local church that God loves them, that they are valuable, that they do have a future. And Jesus came for them as well as everybody else. Next slide. And the good news is every year in the past decades, 135,000 plus children have come to Christ. So each year, out of those 8,000 churches, they get kids saved, and it mounts up to over 135,000 children per year. It's phenomenal fruit that comes from this ministry. 
So um, after the service, I've got a table out there where um, I've got these children. Gracia, I've got here from Togo. She's been waiting 440 days. And um, she uh, lives with a mother. She's not got a father. And um, she needs to be released from poverty in Jesus' name. It costs $11.07 a week. And that is a small amount of money, but it makes a massive difference in countries like Togo. And so, um, um, on your chairs, there's uh, some pictures of children there. I'd love us to just pray for them right now, if that's okay. And uh, I know that the prayers of the righteous avails much. So if you can take a hold of one of those children, that would be wonderful. Let's just pray for them. Father, as we hold these children before you, we pray for them. And uh, we are able to speak into their situation. And we pray that they be released from poverty in Jesus' name. May your kingdom come into their lives and that massive change takes place and they be set free. We ask this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Now, Pastor Peter, are you happy for me to preach from here or? A little bit later, no problem. Thank you so much. Good job. Um, we, have, we don't have any children. We're going to sing again. Um, Amazing grace, my chains are gone.
Um, we need two volunteers for offering, please. Thank you. Let's give thanks to the offering. Father, we pray for your church here at Salem Baptist. Thank you that you show the way. It is you who blesses our offerings and brings your word and saving presence to those we support in your name, both here, at home and overseas. We ask for your blessing on the families serving in Thailand, Christina in Kenya, and for your presence and love taken each week into local schools in Kids Hope. Father, we ask for your provision for the organisation Compassion, for each child, for each staff member, and for each mentor. We ask protection for children who live in places that suffer unrest, that your word and spirit will come to young lives. Thank you that you bring healing in places where there is exploitation of the most vulnerable, interrupted schooling, outside influences that seek to destroy. Thank you when children are released from poverty, that your love can change lives. And for those who lack family support or are persuaded to give up their children, to arrange marriages. Father God, we bring before you our church here at Gumaraka and ask your blessing on each family here today. Each interaction during the week with those who lead Bible studies. For Peter as he brings us your word each week. For David today as he brings us your word. For Lynn as she prepares for the meeting next week. For Fiona with kids' church preparation. And the small, important things done in your name, like cleaning or cooking or music preparation. We pray for our friends. For Joe and Dorothy. For Val and Bob and Myrna. For those who are absent today and for ourselves during the week as we seek to serve you and glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to have one more song and then David's going to come up and bring the Bible reading and his message to us. We're going to sing, I stand on every promise of your word.
I'm reading from Luke 4, verses 1 to 4. Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. Jesus ate nothing all that time and became very hungry. Then the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become a loaf of bread. But Jesus told him, No, the scriptures say, People do not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Just pray. Father, we ask that by your Spirit you would speak to us. Bring a revealing of your word to help us be about your business. We ask in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Lovely. Well, it's interesting days we live in, don't you agree? Um, there's never been quite a time like it in my lifetime anyway, and uh, I've been living for near on 50 years. Actually, it might be a few more than that. But uh, um, It's an incredibly unsettling time, um, not just in a particular city or even a particular state. It's worldwide. And um, the um, challenge is uh, uncertainty. People feel uncertain about what's happening. Um, but um, it's a great opportunity as well for us as a people. Great opportunity to answer some questions uh, because um, people ask questions, particularly at times like this, like what's life all about? Um, the, the news the other week said that there's been unprecedented resignations of people in the workplace, that they're moving from their job that they've been familiar with to look elsewhere because they are living in uncertain times and that begin, brings about great unsettling. And so um, it's a tremendous opportunity for the church to come and answer some questions. I know as a young man, I used to ask the question, what's life all about? I, I get born and uh, I live till I'm 80, 90. Um, and then, then what? And what's been the point? And so um, at some stage in each of our lives, and certainly the people in this community would be asking what I call the three big questions. And I'll go through each one, and I promise to be finished by four o'clock, he said, I have to be finished. That's just a joke, don't leave. Um, who am I, why am I here, and where am I going? They're the three big questions. Evolution says of the three big questions, who am I? You're an accident. Why am I here? No reason. And where am I going? Nowhere. Gosh, that's a bit depressing really, isn't it? But when you take God out of the equation, if uh, you have a belief in evolution without a God, then that's the answer that it comes up with. Um, and then in 1 Corinthians 15.32, the Apostle Paul says, then let us eat, drink and be merry, for tomorrow we die. So, um, but I believe that there is a God. And then the next question then is, if there is a God, who is he? Because um, Google tells me that there are over how many was it? 4,300 religions in the world. 4,300 plus religions. And they've all got their gods in there. 
You've got Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, Sikhism, Baha'i, Rastafarian, Shinto, Christians. What's the truth? If you're a visitor here today and you're on a journey, keep going on the journey to discover who God is. Um, the Bible is big on identity. Um, God has got so many um, um, genealogies in the scriptures. In fact, the New Testament opens up with a genealogy. And it's a description of where somebody's come from, their identity. So it um, goes through 42 generations. Then Luke 3, 23 to 38, another genealogy. The scripture that I read to you, the first, Jesus just beginning his ministry, the first thing that he's challenged on is his identity, who he is. If you are the son of God. And then he quotes Deuteronomy 8.3. Man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. In other words, Jesus was saying, my identity is not found by performing for you, Satan. My identity is not in what I do, but in who I am. And the word of God is where you discover who you are. Um, Genesis 1.27, we might have that scripture up there. Three big questions, next one, who am I? There it is. Genesis 1.27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. You and I are the image of God. Look at the person next to you. Go on, have a look at them. There's the image of God. The Bible tells me that God is spirit. In John 4, 24, when Jesus is with the woman at the well, she says, I perceive that you're a prophet. Um, do we um, worship God here in Samaria or do we go to Jerusalem and worship there, Mount Moriah? And Jesus said, neither. God is spirit. And those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So, what I deduce from that is that I am a spirit. I have a soul and I live in a body. As you can see, this magnificent specimen before you. I live in this. You've got to have a body to be on the planet. Even Jesus had to get a, had to get a body. But I'm inside this body. And one day it will fall to the ground dead I'm not trying to be uh, too cheerful here but my spirit and my soul will leave the body and the body will be left the good news is that to God promises eternal life and we sang about that see we are here to understand our own identity first, knowing who you are. And you are valuable, you are unique. There's no other person in the world like you. You are incredible. You are God's snowflake. Come on. Don't try and be somebody else, be who you are. Because you are needed by the kingdom of God to be who you are and don't try and make somebody else like you. We only want one of you. We can't cope with two of you. One's enough. Amen? Yeah. Um, God, right through the scriptures, Jesus in his ministry was always talking about his identity, who he is. He asked them in Matthew 16, he said, who do men say that I am? And the, the, the disciples responded, some say John the Baptist, one of the prophets, Jeremiah, Elijah. Yeah, but who do you say that I am? And then Peter pipes up, says, you're the Christ, 
the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon by Jonah, because flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And upon this rock I will build my church. Not the rock of Peter, but the rock of what Peter got, which was revelation of the identity of Christ. Jesus at the Last Supper, he broke the bread. Now, they practice this, this very, in this age now, in Jewish culture, they still break the bread at Passover, the matzah bread, and they break it into three pieces. And it represents Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When Jesus broke that bread into three pieces, he would have picked the middle piece up and he said, this is my body. In other words, he was saying to those Hebrew boys, I am the Isaac. And as we know the story of the Isaac, that Abraham took Isaac to um, take him to the altar and sacrifice him. But God said, stay thy hand, don't kill him. But this time, God was going to go through with it. And when Jesus went to the altar, God didn't say, stay thy hand. That's good old King James language, by the way. He went through with it. So your identity of who you are, you are a child of God. You are valuable. You have a purpose. You are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in your body. And the body does wear out. Gosh. When you're 20 and 30, even 40s, it's, it's all wonderful and you're thinking, I'm going to live forever. Then you hit 50s. And you start getting up in the morning and going, gosh, what's that? Come on, don't make me feel alone here. <laughs> and I look in the mirror and I think, who the heck is that? Yeah. See, on the inside, I'm about 19. It's just this outside, it, it's not immortal. And this is the thing for the world. People go about living a hectic life and not giving any thought to what's next. People are so busy. Don't have time for that. Don't have time for church. Don't have time. We have to make time to discover the truth. Um, my spirit wants to do the right thing. My spirit is self-giving. My soul, which is close to my spirit, but it's different. It says in um, Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, able to divide asunder the joints and the marrow, the soul and the spirit. Joints and marrow are very close. Soul and spirit are very close, but they're both different. Your spirit is self-giving. Your soul is self-expression. You express yourself through your soul. You're seeing my soul at work as I express myself from here. And somebody with a damaged soul finds it hard to express themselves. And you live in a body. And my body is self-serving. The biggest problem I have is not the devil. He doesn't help. But the biggest problem I have is me. And the biggest problem you have is, is you. Yeah, <laughs> it's going to say it's you. Not me, you. So we, we need to just establish this because as we go out into the community, and this church... Uh, and I was talking to Pastor Peter this morning, uh, back in the 1840s. Was that right? Oh, yeah, but the church began, obviously, back even before then. In Gamaraka, you are here for a purpose. 
not just to have meetings on the Sunday, although that, that's wonderful, but you have a purpose. So, who am I? You are a child of God. It says in John 1.12, to all those that received him, he gave them the right to become the children of God. You are a child of God. Jesus came to make a way so that we could be adopted into the family of God. <clears throat> Why am I here? So who am I? I'm a child of God. Why am I here? You are here for a purpose. And Jesus gives us a clue to that purpose in Matthew 6, 33. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. He goes on to speak to the disciples and says, uh, I've come to fulfill the law and the prophets. Um, now you're called to love God with all your strength, with all your very being, and love one another. Now, loving God is easy. It's wonderful. Loving you is a bit more difficult. Can anybody say amen to that? People are the challenge. But that's what we call to love God and love people. We're not here to live by the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments reveal our brokenness. It tells us that in the scripture. I'm here to love God and love you. I want to develop the kingdom of God inside of me. See, the kingdom's within. All the stuff of the faith is invisible. Spiritual things are invisible. My words that I speak, which is spirit, are invisible. Your eye gate and your ear gates receiving these words, coming down into your spirit, but it's all invisible. God is invisible. I wish God would sometime appear by putting his face through the clouds and just going... Boom. and letting the world know that he's here but he says my creation is a testimony as you look at creation around us see otherwise it's all just a big accident but I believe the creative genius of God created all these things so we're here to know who we are, to know why we're here. We're here to advance the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is within. So I want to develop and grow the kingdom of God inside of me. How do I do that? With your Bible studies, with your interconnection with one another, learning about the spiritual things. Jesus in John 6 said, the words that I speak, they are spirit and life. This is a spirit book. As I look into it, it becomes a mirror to who I am and a mirror to who God is. You cannot get to know God by just doing a meditation. I'm not against you meditating on the things of God, but just to sit and go, mm, you're not going to learn what God's like. You find out what God's like through this that's why I encourage you go to Bible studies read the Bible the devil wants people not to be in the word of God you have inside of you everything you need to fulfill God's purposes for your life who am I? Why am I here? You are equipped. You have inside of you faith, hope and love. Every human being has got faith, hope and love. When I made that decision to follow Christ, 
the faith, hope, and love inside of me became the God kind of faith, hope, and love. Faith that can move mountains. It says in Romans 12, 3, to every person has been given the measure of faith, the God kind of faith that can move mountains. The hope, the hopes when all hopes lost, Romans 15, 13, Now may the God of hope, of hope fill you with all joy and peace that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we have love inside of us. The agape love of God is inside of you and inside of me. It's just learning to get it out. Ephesians 3.20 Now he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can think or even imagine according to the power that works within us. See the power is inside of us. So often we're always calling out to God to do things. God will you move? God will you change such and such? Will you do this, that and the other? God's not the problem. Come on. He's not the problem. It's us. And once we recognize that, that's good. Then we can put things in place of knowing that the power of God resides within you and I. You are all called to something. God's not left anybody out. You may have to go on the journey to discover that, but you are called to something in regard to the kingdom of God. So, who am I? Why am I here? Next one. Where am I going? John 1 John 2 25 says and this is the promise that he has promised us eternal life I love 1st Corinthians 15 it's great scripture talks about the resurrection you and I when you die your body will go to the ground your spirit and your soul the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So you're going to be in the presence of God. But then when Jesus returns, you're going to get a new body. Come on. Yeah. I'm going to have long flowing hair. I'll be six foot two. But not only that, you're going to have a body that is immortal. A body that can eat food, drink, walk through walls and translate its position from one place to another. How do I know this? Because Jesus, the first resurrected man, that's what he did. He walked through walls. It says the disciples were in the room and the doors were locked and Jesus appeared. He ate with them, he drank with them. Come on, this is good news. See, if, if this is not true, then eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. But where you and I are going, we're going to be in the presence of God. Jesus is coming back to the planet to judge the planet. See, that, see, our job is not to judge. We are not here to be the um, police morality, telling people what they should and shouldn't do. That's not our job. Our job is to love people. When Jesus returns, he's going to bring the judgment. Our message to the community of Gamaraka is that they belong. They belong to God. Come on. They belong to God. 
And we've got to accept them, not because of their behavior, but because God loves them. Too often the church has been sidetracked by behavior. You don't get to heaven because of your behavior. Come on. You can never be good enough. Now that's not an excuse to be naughty, but you're not, we're called to receive Christ. I'm not going to get to heaven by being good. I get to heaven because of what Jesus has done. As a consequence of that, I want to do what's good. I want to be good. My spirit does, but I've got this battle raging with my flesh. Come on, don't look at me like that. Jesus came from heaven. Heaven is a real place. Have a look in Revelation 21. It's got a new heaven, new earth. No more death, sorrow, crying or pain. God dwelling there with humans. There'll be a new Jerusalem. If you ever get opportunity to go to Israel, go. It's a fascinating place. And they reckon the new Jerusalem is going to have 12 gates. And each gate is made of one pearl. One pearl. Imagine the size of the oyster. The streets are paved with gold, not bitumen. Come on. And in the twinkling of an eye, this is all going to take place. Boy, we're, going to, we're just going to be so shocked. We're all going to get a new hairdo. You just go boing. So, I want to encourage you. Um, we are here to help, to be a part of the kingdom of God advancing. And you and I are here to love God, to love people, and bring answers to questions that people will be asking and are asking. I don't know if I told you this before, I probably did, but so I had a group of young people say to me, how old are you going to be when you're in heaven? And I thought, that's an interesting question. And I found some scripture. Yes. Would you like to know how old you're going to be according to the word of God? Well, it's in 1 Corinthians 15. It says this, As he is, so we shall be. So I figured, how old was Jesus when he died? That'll do me. So I said this to these young people and they all went, oh, that's so old. And I said, um, <laughs> believe me, that is not old. Who's happy with 33? I see all those hands. Yeah. So, God's good. But it really is important because we're not here just to exist. We're here for a purpose. Otherwise, we should have a holy gun here. And when somebody comes and gives their life to Christ, we shoot them and send them to heaven. But no, we're here to bring people into the kingdom so that they can find their part that they play in advancing God's kingdom. Look, with all the stuff that's going on, I've got good news. I've read the back of the book. He wins. <laughs> good news and people today look at the church and reject things and are very negative towards the church but the church is precious to God you are precious to God and this building isn't the church you're the church and you're valuable and you have a great future um, I want to show you a three-minute video of a young man called Rich Bermondera. 
and how his life was changed as uh, he was released from poverty in Jesus name please come and see me to be involved with the poor um, Jesus said go into all the world and preach the gospel and I ask how can I do that well through sponsorship I know that this child will be hearing the gospel as I sponsor them you all good with that video do you think Technology is wonderful when it works. Sorry. Yeah, that's all right. It's all right. We're all family. If I give you. Uh, Sound. I began the pastor's discipleship effort in 
ministry that exists to train and equip pastors. And I spend a lot of my life training and equipping pastors in the Word of God. Looking back into my life and thinking where I am right now and what I'm doing, I don't think any of this would have been possible without compassion. Compassion works. Everything that was placed within the program has helped build me to who I am right now. Poverty is not just a lack of money, a lack of material food and water. Poverty is in it's deep. My name is Richmond Mondera, and I was released from poverty in Jesus' name. A 15-year-old girl sponsored Richmond, and now he oversights over 3,000 pastors in East Africa. So what a blessing. Thank you so much. God bless you, and thank you for having me. Thank you, David. We're going to finish with um, singing our last song, People of God. have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Amen. <laughs>